Welcome to our Palm Sunday afternoon service. For those that are here and those that are listening online, we hope you have a lovely Palm Sunday and look forward with anticipation to next Sunday, Easter Sunday. I've entitled this Jesus, the Donkey and Us. Call to worship. Jesus is King, King of creation, of all nations, of our lives. Let us worship with joy, gratitude and respect. Hosanna to the Son of David, to God's anointed one. Hosanna to the King who rides a peaceable donkey. Hosanna here and in the highest. Amen. Amen. And we're going to sing our first song this afternoon, Number one from singing the faith, all people that on earth do dwell. Number one. Our first reading today is from Psalm 118, verses 1 to 2 and 19 to 29. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Let Israel say, his love endures forever. Verse 19. Open for me the gates of the righteous. I will enter and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord through which the righteous may enter. I will give you thanks for you answered me. You have become my salvation. The stone the builders rejected 
has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this, and it is marvellous in our eyes. The Lord has done this this very day. Let us rejoice today and be glad. Lord, save us. Lord, grant us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. From the house of the Lord we bless you. The Lord is God, and he has made his light shine on us. With bows in hand, join in the festal procession up to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will praise you. You are my God, and I will exalt you. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Amen. Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, Lord of Lords, King of Kings, your love for us transforms and startles us. Your gift to us amazes and bewilders us. Your life given for us brings us to our knees. Your abundance reveals our poverty. Your presence comforts and upholds us. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, Lord of Lords, King of Kings, we adore you like no other. Jesus of Nazareth, born for us in Bethlehem, you humbled yourself for us on a donkey riding to Jerusalem. You called us to serve you, and in easy times we lay down our coats for you and spread the branches on the road. But when the going gets tough, when we are called out to stand up for you, so often we lose our voice, mutter under our breath, turn the other way and walk not with you, but stand rooted to the spot with fear. Forgive us, Lord Jesus, that we so often do not shout out for your kingship. No matter how much we deny or betray you, Jesus, in your great mercy, you wipe away our tears of sorrow and regret. You cleanse us from the pain and anguish, and you shout out to us that our sins, yes, even ours, are forgiven. Praise God. Amen. And we're going to sing the Lord's Prayer, number 762, in the book, or off of the wall.
us kneel to take up our offer. O oh God, we bring you these, our financial gifts, on this Palm Sunday, the day when you rode into Jerusalem and you were that offering to be sacrificed in five days' time. You were that sacrifice that said you were prepared to give everything for us. Lord, in return, I accept these, our gifts. In Jesus' name, Amen. And now I'm going to ask Sylvia to read our first New Testament lesson from the book of Mark. The reading is taken from Mark 11, verses 1 to 11. The triumphant entry into Jerusalem. As they approached Jerusalem, near the towns of Bethphage and Bethany, they came to the Mount of Olives. Jesus sent two of his disciples on ahead with these instructions. Go to the village there ahead of you. As soon as you get there, you will find a colt tied up that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it here. And if someone asks you why you are doing that, tell him that the master needs it and will send it back at once. So they went and found a colt out in the street, tied to the door of a house. As they were untying it, some of the bystanders asked them, what are you doing untying that colt? They answered just as Jesus had told them, and the bystanders let them go. They brought the colt to Jesus, threw their cloaks over the animal, and Jesus got on. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches in the fields and spread them on the road. The people who were in front and those who followed behind began to shout, Praise God! God bless him who comes in the name of the Lord! God bless the coming kingdom of King David, our Father! Praise God! Jesus entered Jerusalem, went into the temple and looked around at everything. But since it was already late in the day, he went out to Bethany with the twelve disciples. Thank you to God for his holy word. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Sylvia, for reading that. And we're going to sing a traditional Palm Sunday song. Uh, singing the Faith 265, Ride on, ride on in majesty.
We listen to that song every Palm Sunday, and I wonder how many times we look beyond the song that we're singing and at the words. And for a couple of minutes, I'd just like us to concentrate on this beautiful hymn. When was it written? Well, it was written in 1820, and it was written by a bloke called Milman, right? What do them words mean to you? What does the words lowly pomp mean? We all know what pomp and pageantry is. Last year we saw the coronation of King Charles III. But this is opposite. This is lowly pomp. This is where Jesus, the Son of God, rides on a lonely donkey. A lowly donkey. You know, Jesus didn't have to do that. He didn't have to come and do that. He could have done anything. He could, as he said, have legions of angels come in to set him free, to not have to go through what he went through. You know, all these words that you read and you sing, and how many times do we interrogate and drill down and look at them? The Father on his sapphire throne expects. You know, God expected Jesus to follow the plan to the letter. And he did so. And then we talk about bow your head to mortal pain. The mortal pain of dying. Of being hung there, waiting to die. And I just thought that this song that we sing, even the, the tune like as a, a plodding of the donkey, it's such a lovely word. And I hope that every time you ring, read it now, or sing it, you're reminded of some of the words that are in there. Thank you. And now Neil's going to read our next reading for us. Reading from John, chapter 12, verses 12 to 16. See how your king comes. The next day, a huge crowd that had arrived for the feast heard that Jesus was entering Jerusalem. They broke up off palm branches and went out to meet him. And they cheered, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in God's name. Yes, the King of Israel. Jesus got a young donkey and rode it, just as the scripture has it. No fear, daughter Zion. See how the King of Kings comes, riding a donkey's colt. The disciples didn't notice the fulfilment of many scriptures at, that, at the time, but Jesus was glorified. They remembered that what was written about him matched what was done to him. Thanks be to God for the reading of his word. Thank you, Neil. Thank you, Neil, for reading that. Now we're going to go from a hymn wrote in 1820, 224 years ago, to a hymn that was written in 2018. It's a new song for us all, and I spoke to our musical director on Monday, who said that she could sing it and lead it, because you might as well ask me to speak double Dutch, because I can't do any of that. And it's called Song Hosanna and Die. So, our musical director. Right, I shall play the tune first, just to get an idea. It goes like this.
See, we've learned something new. A new song, led by our fabulous music director, Pam. And now I'm going to ask Paul to read us about the donkey. The donkey. My mother told me when they sold me to their Jerusalem friend about the night everything changed. A long time ago when she was very young after the journey she carried Mary, Mary carefully seeing her time was near. They sheltered at last in a decent place. The other beasts were welcoming. Though it was crowded, my mother said. And when at last they laid the baby in the straw and everyone slept, then my mother said, then, she said, and nuzzled my back as she told it, the child opened his eyes and looked into hers. Then she knew who he was and the wonder. So she rubbed his baby head very gently with the softness of her nose. And somehow she knew from him that the last foal she would bear would carry him at some great moment to come. Now she was old. They kept her long for love. And because she carried them to Egypt, after the kindness of the shepherds, clumsily wandering, and the great star through the rafters, and robed strangers, smelling of strange things. After they left in a hurry, Mary and child and baggage all piled on mother's back. Now she was old, and I was to be sold. Mature now, though her youngest, to work for this friend in Jerusalem. The great moment will come, she said, and you will know him. I never saw her again. And now I too am aging. But it happened as she said, I had forgotten her tale until last week. When strangers came and loosened me from my stall, I was watching over a skittish young foal, the mother being at work. And they led me away to the top of the hill where he waited. He turned, looking into my eyes. Then I knew who he was and the wonder. So I carried him carefully down the hill, carefully seeing his time was near, through the gates and into the city. They needed a steady old beast like me. Well, the noise was so great and the flapping of palms. When he left me, he rubbed his hand across my shoulders and down my spine. You will sire one more foal, he said. Out of time for a beast. But think of Abraham, and your line will bear my sign forever. Across shoulders and back, then blessing, he touched me and turned and went on into the city's heart. And will he return once more? I should like to see him again, one day. O oh Lord, may we too this Palm Sunday know who you are and the wonder. Help us to follow you into the city and walk with your faith, 
with you faithfully through the week to come. And in the darkest hours, Lord, may we cling with faith to your promise that one day we see you again and know the wonder. Amen. You know, what Paul referred to there is the cross of Jesus. It's on the, all donkeys, and it was put there by Jesus. So the story goes. I could say what a week it's been this week, but I can say that what a month it's been for me and Michelle. For the first 12 days, Michelle was in hospital, as you know, and things got better. And on Friday, we had some great results. So I thank you, everybody, that's been praying for us day in, day out, because incredible things have happened. And Michelle's platelets have risen, and everything is looking good, apart from the chemotherapy, which has been put on hold for a week or two until we find out what other plan they could put in place. The chemotherapy had destroyed the bone marrow, the white platelets in the bone marrow, so they're having now to think about what kind of chemotherapy Michelle's going to have, if any. But we just want to thank you, both of us, for everybody praying here and online. So thank you. But this week's been quite a bad week in another way. When I went to prepare this service, my hard drive containing all the things that I keep for church and PowerPoints, etc., was corrupted. It couldn't work, wouldn't work at all. So I began to get a bit panicky, and Michelle began to wonder when I'm ever going to finish preparation and get, move on to things. But this week is nowhere near as bad as the week that was to come. A week contains 168 hours. And in that week that Jesus was going to experience, incredible things happen and are still happening today. Jesus' journey to Jerusalem was, we thought, the culmination of his life. He was 33 years old. He'd been a carpenter learning the trade of his earthly father, Joseph. He'd been obedient to both his parents, with one exception that we know about when he went AWOL in Jerusalem, causing his parents to retrace his steps to find him. And they found him in the temple, listening and learning from these highly educated scholars who were pontificating about points of law. And Jesus was there taking it all in. After that, we don't know much about his teenage years and his 20s, but Luke says at verse 52 of his second chapter, we do know that he grew in favour with God and man. But we do know about Jesus' career and his teaching. Because we have eyewitness accounts about his life, which we call the gospel or the good news today. We can follow Jesus' story from his birth, worshipped by shepherds, visited by kings, growing up in Nazareth, to his baptism by John, to the recruiting of his first 12 disciples. He must have been dynamic, inspirational, and a natural leader because people dropped everything to follow him. His numbers of followers soon increased to 72, and then the gathering snowball momentum as he healed the sick, fed 5,000 and 4,000 people respectively, raised the dead, both Lazarus and the unnamed son in Nain. 
He challenged the social thoughts of the time. He had time for beggars, tax collectors, prostitutes, those who were judged to be sinners by the establishment, and more importantly, he had time for women. He challenged an established church, established church leadership, so much so that they wanted him dead, out of the road. They didn't believe that he had the right credentials. He wasn't of their social standing. He was uneducated in their eyes. But Jesus had something. One of their crowd scuttled to see him in the dark night, frightened of his peers and the establishment. But he needed to know more about Jesus. He needed to ask him some questions. And eventually, that man revealed in time that he believed in Jesus. His name was Nicodemus. Jesus had the determination. He had love and was obedient to God, the Father, and to the plan. Now, we all know about plans. I know from experience that a plan is only good if it's followed to the letter. And in one of my previous life, where planning was essential, I would pick a person who would follow the plan to the letter, rather than somebody who would decide to cut the corner to achieve the goal in a quicker time. Can you remember when we were all at school and the teacher said, I don't care if the answer's wrong. What's that about? Don't care if the answer's wrong, but just show me the workings. Why? She needed to know where you'd gone wrong and she could give you marks for the workings. And that's what Jesus did. He followed the plan. He could say that Jesus was the plan. He knew some of the answers, but not all of them. He had belief and faith that his father wouldn't let him down. He had utmost trust. So now here he is, he's arrived at the gates of Jerusalem. His momentum was up. The crowds thought that this was their moment. The proclamation of a popular king. He was their man. He had no heirs and no graces. But he was a man of God. And guess what? He was their man. The Romans didn't matter no more. He was their king. There were no booing, no hissing at him like a pantomime villain, just loud cheers. Cries of savers were chanted by the crowd. You can almost hear the chants. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. But where were those who had different views? Those who wanted to get rid of him? Were they skulking in the background? Were they crying, Hosanna, quietly? Were they seething that this man had all the attention and not them? Were they plotting in the temple the next step of treachery? But one thing they were, they were conspicuous by their absence. Was Jesus' entry into Jerusalem the beginning of the end of the Roman occupation? Would this man pull it off? After all, his descendant was King David, the greatest king Israel had ever known. Maybe it was in Jesus' DNA. But if the crowds were after a spectacular ending, there was one, but not what they expected but they were going to be disappointed with the outcome. I always remember this same once when I was going to work in an early morning. Hindsight 
is the philosophy of fools. It's easy to give the right answer when you know the results. But these people didn't have high sight, but they thought what was going to happen and they were going to be disappointed. And now we come to a donkey, a beast of burden. That donkey that Paul read about could have been about 30 years old. He could have had the same life story of Jesus. A donkey plods along, following the plan. If you've ever been to Spain on, on a, a burra safari or a donkey safari, the front one will lead, the others will follow, and they know where to turn round and won't go one step further. They are stubborn. And this can be seen in the Old Testament story of Balaam's donkey. Balaam's donkey was taking the prophet Balaam to see beer. And the donkey saw that the angel of the Lord was in front of him and he wouldn't move on. And Balaam then got off and beat the donkey, but he still wouldn't move on. And he beat him again and he still refused to go forward. It was only when Balaam saw the angel of the Lord he realised why the donkey was being so stubborn. I'm told that donkeys are loyal, loving social creatures who have had bad press for centuries and often referred to as being stupid. I want to ask you the perennial question which everybody asks every Palm Sunday from time immemorial. Where would you stand in all of this situation? Where would you be? Jesus' journey was coming to an end. He was coming up to Jerusalem. His life was coming to an end, but his mission was going to be fulfilled. We're all travelling on our life's journeys. We have our ups and downs, our successes and our disappointments. When we look back at our aspirations and our hopes and we see where we've gone wrong. When we judge our failures against the standards expected by others or set by others. When we try to keep up with the Joneses and get in debt. When we think the grass is greener on the other side of the fence. When we think we know it all and we know best. And it all crashes down. Fair weather friends desert us. Where does that put you on the journey? Can I tell you where that puts you? That puts you in the best place to realise who your best friend is. Jesus. He is like the donkey. He's sharing our load. He's carrying us to our proper destination. He's sure and steady, strong and stubborn refuses to take any shortcuts. Thank God for that. 44 years ago today, an Archbishop in San Salvador, Oscar Romero, was murdered. Terrible time in El Salvador, civil war, drugs wars and everything. And Romero said this, Love cannot be theoretical, neither is it soft or weak, but there is a violence to love not a violence that hurts people, but a violence that resists all that hurts people. It stands up for the powers that exploit and destroy God's beloved children. It's a violent passion that shouts, no more in the name of Christ, no more. It's this kind of love that Jesus demonstrated on the cross. 
and you don't very hear many sermons with Napoleon Bonaparte being quoted. Bonaparte said this, I know men, and I'll tell you that Jesus Christ is no mere man. Between him and every other person in the world, there is no possible term of comparison. Alexander, Caesar, Charlemagne, and I, Bonaparte, have founded empires. But what do we rest our genius on? We rest it on force. Jesus Christ found his empire on love. And at this hour, he said, millions and millions of men will die for him. There's no wonder that we in the crowd shouted, Hosanna, save us. Because we need Jesus in our lives. We need Jesus as our friend, as our saviour. We need Jesus to shine the light on us and guide us in the darkness that surrounds us. Hosanna, Jesus, save us. Amen. Now we're going to have another hymn. This is a bit of a, a pacey hymn, so I don't want you sitting there or standing there looking long-faced. I want everybody to enter into this song and enjoy it. And the dark words show the chorus that we'll sing throughout the verse. So, it's over to you, Pam. to lead us in our prayers of intercession when Anne pauses we will respond with we welcome Jesus we welcome the King thank you Anne
So you will say, we welcome Jesus, we welcome the King. We welcome a time of hope and peace. As we look forward to God's kingdom, we hope for a time when peace will be the foundation and aim of all nations. We look to the leaders of nations, factions, armies and dictatorships where peace is not present. And we call them to respond to the suffering and heartache around them by negotiating and bringing peace. Among other places, we remember Gaza, Israel, Ukraine, North Korea, Haiti and Sudan. God of all, you made everything and everyone. We pray that people will respond to your desire for all to live lives of peace and that hope would defeat harm. We pray for all who, those whose families, lives and futures have been destroyed by war and conflict. We welcome Jesus. We welcome the King. We welcome a time of love and care. As we look forward to God's kingdom, we hope for a time when love and care are the foundation for all that we do. We give thanks for those in caring professions and those who look after others. God of all, you call all people who are willing to hear. We pray for our health professionals, education, staff, parents and carers. We pray that they would be encouraged and strengthened in these times of tight budgets and lack of resources. We remember children and young people who may be facing worries and challenges and we ask for your help for all who are struggling because of physical or mental health. May they, they and all in need feel your comfort and healing. We welcome Jesus. We welcome the King. We welcome a time of safety and well-being. As we look forward to God's kingdom, we hope for a time when all will feel safe, protected and well. We ask that those who cause harm through bullying, abuse, internet stalking and cruel messaging may repent of the pain and damage they have caused. God of all, you created us to live in safety. We pray for the police, the criminal justice system, and all who work to protect others and investigate those who cause harm. We pray for laws to be used wisely so that young and old alike can live free of fear and abuse and bullying. We pray for those who lead and set examples to young people that they would be wise in showing the risks of social media. We welcome Jesus. We welcome the King. We welcome a time of life and growth. As we look forward to God's kingdom, we hope for a time when all will be full of the enjoyment of life and will grow in faith in you. We look to those who lead us in our church, in our country and our neighbourhoods, that they would work to keep people safe and happy and they, that they would have the wisdom to spend limited money wisely. God of all, you give us all we need. We pray for our government and parliament as they use scarce resources, plan budgets and work out how to spend money for the benefit of the nation. We pray for local elections in a few weeks and the campaigning that has just started. We remember our church leaders here and in this area 
and asked that they would work together across denominations to bring the life and growth that can be found in Jesus to our friends and neighbours. We welcome Jesus. We welcome the King. We welcome our life and calling. As we look forward to God's kingdom and remembering that amazing journey into Jerusalem, we look to ourselves. May each one of us, young and old, know the love of God through the gift of Jesus, the power of God through Jesus' death, and the joy of God through his resurrected life. God of each one of us, you know all we are and all we need. We pray for ourselves. May we hear your call in our lives and do all we can to share your love and your kingdom with others. Amen. Our closing hymn is Singing the Faith 351, In Christ Alone.
I'd just like to thank all those who have taken part, both here and online. I hope that this week of Holy Week will bring you blessings to each and every one of us. As the crowds gather to welcome and celebrate the coming of Kingdom of Freedom, peace and justice, so we lay ourselves before our donkey-riding King, Jesus Christ our Lord. Let his vision be our vision, his kingdom be our kingdom, his call be our call, his journey be our journey, and his life, death and resurrection be our salvation. Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Amen. Thank you. 